So today I have, don't forget the source. However far the stream flows, it never forgets its source. However far the stream flows, it never forgets its source. This is an old saying of the Yoruba people out of West Africa. It's passed on from one generation to the next, and it serves to remind the people that no matter how far they travel from home, you should never forget your tradition and your culture. In 1621, William Bradford established a tradition that we will keep here in a few days. Governor William Bradford declared a time of thanksgiving after reflecting on the challenges and the trials that the pilgrims had faced during their first year in the New World. William Bradford and the pilgrims were a religious people who placed their trust in God. They felt it was only by the grace of God that they were able to survive the first winter in Plymouth Colony. Now, the Bible doesn't specifically talk about the pilgrims. It doesn't specifically talk about God's hand providing for their health, their safety, their nourishment, but learning the story can provide us with an understanding of how being faithful can result in receiving blessings from God. We have gotten away from the, our source as a nation, and therefore some of the blessings that we may have once had aren't there anymore because we have fallen away from God. What I'd like to do is take a short synopsis of the Pilgrim's Voyage, voyage in their first year in the new world is we considered how God may have played a part in the pilgrims' success here in the new world. So the Mayflower weighed anchor. That's a fancy nautical term. I had to look it up. I didn't know what it meant, but in the context of the reading, it's a fancy nautical term to say they left. So the Mayflower left port in September 6th, on September 16th of 1620. Now, the number of passengers that they had, depending on which history book you look at or what internet source you look at, varies by several people. But what I'm going to go with is 101 prospective settlers aboard. And this was just pilgrims. They had several crew um, up into the 60s, 70s, maybe in the 80 crew members on the Mayflower. After 65 storm-tossed days, the Mayflower landed not in Virginia as they had planned. They all thought they were going to Virginia but rather they landed in Cape Cod. Throughout the rough voyage, they had lost one of their members by death and ended up gaining two by birth. They landed in Cape Cod in the month of November. They were not prepared for the harsh winter that they had ahead of them. See, they had believed the glowing reports that where they were landing in Virginia would be a little bit similar to the southern coast of France, since the two areas were basically the same latitude. But as I mentioned, instead the pilgrims were confronted with a very severe winter on a rocky coast in Cape Cod. Come spring, the Mayflower passengers lost half of their population. Again, those numbers are a little bit different depending on which source you look at. Roughly 13 of the 18 married women died and 50% of the entire colony had perished due to the harsh winter. William Bradford, being the governor, his, he was charged with leading the survivors, now settled in Plymouth. If you look at the history books again, his leadership style would have been considered pretty harsh by today's standards. He actually required if you wanted to eat, you better work. A little bit different than what we see today. Today you get a check from the government and you don't have to do anything. William Bradford was a little bit harsher. If you wanted to eat, you better start working. The pilgrims, we know, escaped many Indian, Indian attacks during that first winter. Two of the Indians in the neighborhood, so to speak, were Samoset and Squanto. The interesting thing about these two Indians were that they could speak English. They could speak English. And we'll get into that just a little bit more as, as we go through the sermon. Um, the English-speaking uh, Indians allowed them to develop a treaty, a peace treaty, between the pilgrims and the tribe that was there. And the pilgrims felt that this was an act of God, that these Indians were actually there. We'll let you make the decision on that as we go through. 
Well, like I said, I'm not aware of any specific evidence in the Bible to support that God truly intervened in the pilgrim's survival. But the story of Squanto is definitely one that's going to make you kind of scratch your head and say, I don't know, maybe. Maybe God did have a hand in this. Prior to the pilgrims arriving in the New World, an Indian named Squanto, which I mentioned, he was taken captive by the English. So he was living in that Plymouth area prior to the pilgrims arriving, but before that happened, he was actually taken captive and brought to England. There is where he learned English. And the reason that the English took him, brought him back to England to te teach him English, was they wanted an Indian from the New World that knew the layout of the land and also spoke English to take them through and find the most valuable parts of the country. See, they didn't speak English, and if the Indians weren't able to speak English, they wouldn't have had that level of communication. So the English took this Indian, took him to England, and, and taught him the language. Squanto then returned on, this is the one that most people know in the, in the history books that you learn in school, Squanto returned to the New World on Captain John Smith's boat. So he was there once, went to England, now he's back. This ship landed in Plymouth. Here's the interesting part. This poor Indian, he was taken again, this time by the Spanish. So the Spanish took him back to Spain on, job, on Captain John Hunt's boat. While he was in Spain, Squanto was rescued and brought into the Christian faith. He was then taken to London, where he joined with a merchant and left for New England. In 1619, he landed back in Plymouth. What are the chances that an Indian speaking English, understanding the Christian faith, in 1619 was there when the pilgrims arrived? Again, now the Bible doesn't talk about whether or not God had any hand in that, but kind of interesting, makes you wonder. So the story gets just a little bit better. Squanto was from a tribe in Plymouth that was known for being extremely vicious and territorial. If any Indian tribe or explorer would have stepped foot on that territory, they would have been killed. They didn't like outsiders, this particular tribe. The interesting thing was that Squanto and his tribe were located at Plymouth when the pilgrims would eventually land. However, prior to the return of Squanto and eventually the pilgrims, Squanto's entire tribe was killed by a plague. This would have allowed for the safe landing of the pilgrims. Again, the Bible doesn't specifically talk about the pilgrims, but we do know that God can prepare a place for safe landing. Turn to Exodus 27 and verse 20. Exodus 27 and verse 20. Again, this is not related to the pilgrims. It's related to the Israelites. But it says, see, I am sending an angel ahead of you to guard you along the way and to bring you to the place I have prepared. Pay attention to him and listen to what he says. Do not rebel against him. He will not forgive your rebellion since my name is in him. Verse 22, it says, if you listen carefully to what he says and do all that I say, I will send an enemy to your enemies and will oppose those who oppose you. My angel will go ahead of you and bring you into the land of the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hivites, and all those other ites. There's a lot of ites. And he says at the end, I will wipe them out. I will wipe them out. So if you go back to the pilgrim's journey to the new world, you right, might remember that before they sailed for what was Virginia, they lived in Holland. They didn't come directly from England. They actually lived in Holland for about 10 years. And the reason they moved to Holland was to escape religious persecution of England. However, while they were in Holland, they started to see kind of a, a degradation of the moral character of the, the people in Holland. They saw that that particular society was falling further and further away from God. And they wanted to protect their kids from growing up in that culture. So they decided, you know what, we're getting out of here too. We've got to leave. We've got to find a new place. And they had contracted with a merchant, which was ended up being the Mayflower, and they ended up sailing to the New World. These were a pretty amazing chain of events. 
pretty amazing chain of events. And it makes you wonder, did God have a hand in their arrival in the new world? Now, we may not know the answer to this question until maybe we ask God ourselves in the kingdom. But what we do know is that the pilgrims truly believed that their safety was a result of God's intervention. Whether it was or not, we may not know, but the pilgrims truly believed that. They believed that them arriving, making this journey, and all of those different chain of events was a result of God's blessings and guidance. And despite the overwhelming trials, the overwhelming challenges that the pilgrims faced, the settlement survived. The Mayflower actually returned back in April of 1621 after that harsh winter. Not one of the pilgrims got back on that boat to go home because they truly believed that God would take care of them, that they came for religious freedom, and that although they lost so many people that first winter, that if they remained faithful and obedient to God, that he would protect them and, and bring them through. If we turn back to Exodus, looking at verse 24, we can see what was in store for those who arrive in a location that God prepares for them and also keeps their commandments, keeps his commandments. We know that the pilgrims were obedient to God, at least the way that they understood it. And they knew that if they remained faithful, they would receive the gifts that we read here in Exodus 27, verse 24. It says, do not bow down before their gods or worship them or follow their practices. See, they moved to Holland and they started to see things that they didn't like. It didn't align with what, what they believed, so they got out of there. It says, you must demolish them and break their sacred stones to pieces. Worship the Lord your God, and his blessings will be on your food and your water. I will take away sickness from among you, and none will miscarry or be barren in your land. I will give you a full lifespan, it says. By autumn of that next year, the pilgrims had recovered from that very harsh winter. They were able to grow crops. They were able to hunt. And part of that was, we know, you know, we see the pictures at Thanksgiving time of the Indians teaching the pilgrims how to plant corn. And there was some truth to that. Squanto and his tribe had developed a way of planting corn that led to a whole lot more production than what the pilgrims had known. They always planted the seeds with a dead fish, which would provide that fertil fertilization for the corn so that it would be successful. And you can also read some of the, I won't get, don't have time to get into it, but you can also read that the Indians noticed the pilgrims after they planted, they would pray for rain. And that particular, prior to that, that year that they were there, they had had a long drought, and the Indians would do the same thing. God would bring these driving rains, the Indians thought. But when the pilgrims prayed, they noticed that they got a gentle rain, and the crops grew. So even the Indians were starting to see that, man, these pilgrims got something going on here. God may be involved with, with, with their lives. So it's a very interesting story that is related to the pilgrims that you really don't see in school. You've got to dig a little bit deeper. So they made it through that winter, feeling that God truly blessed them. William Bradford established what we now know as that first Thanksgiving. The pilgrims gave thanks to God. They washed down some roasted venison, some wild duck probably. They probably made some cornbread. Some accounts say that they made some wine from the native grapes. And the whole list of their, their diet, you can, you can certainly look that up, but we won't get into that. But it definitely had venison and cornbread and duck and the things that you would have seen in Cape Cod at that time in 1621. Brethren, Thanksgiving, it's not, only day, it's not only a day in November. It's not only a day in November, but it really needs to be a way of life. Are we only to be thankful on Thanksgiving? Are we only to give God thanks on that one particular day? Or is that something that we need to do on a regular basis? Interesting, listen to a couple of sermons on Thanksgiving, and one theme that kind of came up over and over is being thankful. How being thankful is, that's a passive thing. Versus Thanksgiving, which is active, actually giving thanks one compared these two things, thankful and thanksgiving, to if you thought about giving someone a gift, that would be like being thankful. But if you actually gave that person the gift, that's like giving thanks to God, thanksgiving. 
I thought that was interesting. I'm sure we all want God to actually bless us rather than thinking about blessing us, right? As a nation, as a nation we have definitely fallen away and forgotten our religious roots. As a country, we certainly have. We often are not a thankful nation, let alone a nation of thanksgiving. Think about the actual name that many use for thanksgiving. What do we call it? Turkey Day. They've even taken the name Thanksgiving out of the entire day. We call it Turkey Day. Many people, you'll see, ah, Turkey Day, happy Turkey Day. No, we've forgotten. We've fallen away from our roots. See, God wants us to give thanks. He wants us to be thankful for the blessings that he's provided us. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, you don't have to turn there. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 6, it tells us to rejoice always. 17 says pray continually. And 18, give thanks in all circumstances. For all circumstances. About being thankful even when we are tried, even when we have challenges, even when those trials come about. So this day of Thanksgiving that the Pilgrims instituted, it was celebrated sporadically throughout our nation's history up until the time of George Washington. George Washington was the first president that actually proclaimed a national day of Thanksgiving. And at that time it was November 26th was a specific day, 1789. He made it clear, our first president, that a day of Thanksgiving is a day that the nation needs to set aside to give thanks and to pray. Give thanks to God and to pray. Here's just a portion of his proclamation. It says, by the President of the United States of America, a proclamation. This was written by George Washington. It says, where is, it is the duty of all nations to acknowledge the providence of Almighty God, to obey his will, to be grateful for his benefits, and humbly to implore his protection and favor and whereas both House of Congress have by their joint committee requested me to recommend to the people of the United States a day of public thanksgiving and prayer to be observed by acknowledging with grateful hearts the many favors of Almighty God, especially by affording them an opportunity peaceably to establish a form of government for their safety and happiness. Much more eloquent writing back then than what we see today. Psalm 131, verse 1. Psalm 131, verse 1. It says, I will praise you, Lord, with all my heart before the gods. I will sing your praise. I will bow down towards your holy temple and will praise your name for unfailing love and your faithfulness. See, George, under, George Washington understood that we as a nation should praise God for his love and his faithfulness to each of us. What's interesting is just as the pilgrims experienced all of those difficulties prior to their day of thanksgiving, our newly formed nation had just come out of a war in extremely difficult times as well. And George Washington felt that because we were able to come out of that, that we should have a day of thanksgiving. He continued on in his proclamation, and he said, Now, therefore, I do recommend and assign Thursday, the 26th day of November next, to be devoted by the people of these states to serve of the great and glorious being, who is the beneficent author of all good things that was, that is, or that will be, that we may then all unite in rendering unto him our sincere and humble thanks for his kind care, and protection of the people of this country. Again, George Washington understood that all the protections and the blessings and the things that we've experienced as a nation wasn't a result of his doing as the president or the people's doing. It was a result of God truly blessing the people of that nation, our nation. President Washington knew that the favor we enjoyed as a nation, that they were all gifts from God. They were all gifts from God. Genesis 49, verse 25. Again, we know this one. Genesis 49, 25 says, by the, by the God of your Father, who will help you, the Almighty, who will bless you with the blessings of heaven above. So 
So it tells us that our blessings do come from God. Because of God is the source of our blessings, we are to give thanks to him. Another name for you, Sarah Hale. Sarah Hale, 74-year-old magazine editor. We're going to fast forward a little bit. We're out of the Revolutionary War. We're moving on to the Civil War now, or the end of the Civil War, actually. Sarah Hale, 74-year-old magazine editor, wrote a letter to President Lincoln in September of 1863, so actually just prior to the Civil War, or Civil War ending, urging him to have a day of annual thanksgiving. She explained, you may have observed that for some years past, there has been an increasing interest felt in our land to have the Thanksgiving held on the same day in all of the states. It now needs national recognition and an authoritative fixation only to become permanently an American custom and institution. Interesting fact on Sarah Hale. I was listening to another sermon on Thanksgiving and I can't remember who was actually given the sermon, but indicated that this same individual wrote, Mary had a little lamb. Interesting tidbit. So if you're on Jeopardy, and who urged President Lincoln to have a day of Thanksgiving and wrote, Mary had a little lamb? Apparently it's uh, Sarah Hale. I did not fact check that, but I'm assuming whoever gave the sermon originally did. If not, we'll blame that person. I just can't tell you who it is. So prior to this, each prior to this particular proclamation from President Lincoln, each state had its own Thanksgiving, a Thanksgiving holiday, but it was all done at different times, mainly in New England and some of the northern states. In 1863, in the midst of the bloody Civil War, President Abraham Lincoln gave a proclamation, again, President Proclamation, designating the last Thursday in November a national holiday of Thanksgiving. If we look at the proclamation that Abraham Lincoln gave in 1863, we can see that our 16th president, just like our first, truly understand the purpose of a day of thanksgiving. He knew that we should give thanks because of the blessings that God bestowed upon us. Deuteronomy 28, verse 8. Deuteronomy 28, verse 8. It says, the Lord will command the blessing on you in your barns and in all that you undertake. And he will bless you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Here's what President Lincoln said in his proclamation. He said, the year that is drawing towards a close has been filled with the blessings of fruitful fields and healthful skies. To the bounties which are so constantly enjoyed that we are prone to forget the source from which they come. Others have been added which are so extraordinary in nature that they cannot fail to penetrate and soften even the heart which is habitually insensi insensible to the ever watchful providence of Almighty God. So again, we can see that President Lincoln understood that the blessings that we have was not a result of anything that man did, but from the source of those blessings, which is God the Father. Oftentimes when things are good, we kind of forget why we are doing well. We kind of forget why we have all the things that we have. Sometimes we fall into that trap of getting busy and we forget that we're doing well because God wants us to do well, that God has blessed us with those things that permits us and allows us to do well. Do we sometimes demonstrate maybe a more thankful heart when times are tough? in those times after we've come out of a trial. If you look at all of those days of Thanksgivings, pilgrims had a hard winter, Revolutionary War, Civil War. Those are all the times that we had dedicated days of Thanksgiving. We understood that God brought us out of those things. But how about when times are good, when things are going pretty well? We, for the most part, have pretty good times in our country, despite all the nonsense going on out there. For us, we're, we do okay. We heard about the uh, place in Africa. When you compare what we're going through to them, there's no comparison. So we're doing pretty well overall. And do we forget sometimes to be thankful? If Lost my spot here. Another sermon I listened to. I thought this was very interesting. It was a, therm a sermon on Thanksgiving. And the minister given the sermon, he asked the 
the congregation a question. He asked this. He asked them to think about all of the blessings that you would have right now, sitting here right now today, during this service. What blessings would you have right now if you only were given those things that you thanked God for last night? And he went on to list a couple of things, you know, probably food, maybe some water. It was maybe, maybe not clothes. And then he went on to say it'd be kind of awkward because I don't think I thanked God last night for clothes to be standing up here without that particular blessing. But if you think about it, how often do we thank God for some of those simple things that we have? And had we not had those things, how our life might be different? I think that's kind of an interesting exercise that we might consider doing on a regular basis. Lincoln continued with his Thanksgiving proclamation, and I'd like to share just one more portion. It's quite lengthy. But he says, Population has steadily increased, notwithstanding the waste that had been made in the camp, the siege on the battlefield, and the country rejoicing in the consciousness of augmented strength and vigor is permitted to expect continuance of years with a large increase of freedom. They are the gracious gifts of the Most High God, who while dealing with us in anger for our sins, has nevertheless remembered mercy. Isaiah 30, verse 18. Lincoln was a student of the Bible. He studied the Bible on a regular basis, and part of his proclamation was certainly biblically based, and some of it probably came out of Isaiah 30, verse 18. It says, Therefore the Lord waits to be gracious to you, and therefore he exalts himself to show mercy to you. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all those who wait for him. President Lincoln was quoted saying, In regard to this great book, I have to say this. It is the best gift that God has given man. He said, All the good and the savor, all the good the Savior gave to the world was communicated through this book. But for it, we would not know right from wrong. I thought that was interesting. Governor Bradford, President Washington, President Lincoln all recognized that the blessings that we have truly are gifts from God. And therefore, we should give our thanks to God, not just on Thanksgiving, but every single day. The days of Thanksgiving that each of these men instituted, they were for the purpose of having our nation stop just for a day and give thanks to God for what he has blessed us with. As a nation, do we still do that today? Will the majority of our country on our national holiday of Thanksgiving, will they celebrate it the same way that our nation did in the past, in the true spirit of Thanksgiving? Or will they look at it as a day off from school, a day where we spend eating with family, drinking, and probably watching some football? Is that all Thanksgiving is to most of our country? I want to read that again. Many families will prepare the meal. They'll ring the dinner bell. People will flock to the table, and they'll start feeding their faces. What did they forget? What did they forget? A lot of people will never even give thanks to God for that meal that they're about to eat. We have a song that says, To all things now living. You can probably hum that tune in your head. And what do, what's the purpose of that song? To all things now living, a song of thanksgiving. Who do we give thanks to? We give thanks to God. In James 1, verse 17, as we begin to wrap up, James 1, verse 17, it says, God is the creator and giver, giver of all blessings. God is the creator and the giver of all blessings. God does emphasize thanksgiving over thankfulness. We talked about that before. Mr. Hoosier wrote an article in the, uh, I think it was the Good News, and he had looked at some of the words in the Bible specifically related to thankfulness and thanksgiving. And what he found was that God uses the word thankful three times in the Bible. Words like give thanks, thanksgiving, and similar active phrases are used over 150 times. 
So it's easy to say, yeah, I'm thankful. That's passive. Thanksgiving is actually thanking God for what we have. Brethren, it's important for us to give thanks to God and recognize all that he's given to us. The pilgrims recognized that their survival in the new world was no, nothing less than God's intervention. They truly believed that. They believed that they were able to survive and move another year in Plymouth Colony because God had blessed them. As we look at our National Day of Thanksgiving, we need to remember to whom we owe our thanks. God blessed, blesses each, is a, each of us differently. We all have different blessings, but we are all blessed, and those blessings come from God. Matthew 14, verse 19. Matthew 14, verse 19. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass, taking the five loaves and the two fish, and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. Here's our example of what we need to do before we eat. Before we eat on Thanksgiving and any other time throughout the year, we got to remember that that food that we're about to eat, and we eat so much better than the majority of the, the world, that that meal came from God. There's also an example in Joshua 9, verse 14, where the Israelites didn't do that. It says, the Israelites sampled their provisions, talking about the food, but did not inquire of the Lord. Fancy way to say they didn't ask God's blessing on the food. They didn't thank God for the food that they were about to eat. So let us give thanks to God, for it is through him that we do have all things. Final scripture, Psalm 100, verse 4. It says, enter his gates with thanksgiving. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. Obviously talking about God there. So the same uh, proverb I started with, however far the stream flows, it never forgets its source. Brethren, let us not forget the source of our blessings and remember to always give thanks to God.